الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام ميم ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين الذين يؤمنون بالغيب ويقيمون الصلاة ومما رزقناهم ينفقون والذين يؤمنون بما أنزل إليك وما أنزل من قبلك وبالآخرة هم يوقنون أولئك على هدى من ربهم وأولئك وأولئك هم المفلحون صدق الله العظيم وبعد Respected elders, dearest brothers and sisters, beloved youth Alhamdulillah Tonight we are starting Surah Al-Baqarah which is from amongst the very important, of course every surah is important, but Surah Al-Baqarah, along with many other surahs, they have been granted special significance in the quran Karim. It is reported that on the battle of Hunayn, when the Muslims together with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were going through a lot of difficulty, the battle was you know, enraged, it was flaming. And some of the Muslims at that time, رَأَى النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ مِنْهُمْ تَأَخُّرًا He saw that a little bit, they were hesitating. Somewhere in the middle of the battle, when things were getting very difficult, the Muslims were a little bit, you know, on the offhand. They were not really engaged properly. So when the Prophet ﷺ saw this little bit of hesitation, can we think, what words would the Prophet ﷺ say to them? To encourage them, to motivate them. Don't hesitate, don't stay back. Move forward, go ahead. Jump in the front so that you could protect Islam, protect the Muslims, protect your Prophet ﷺ. What words would he have used? So in my mind, I would think, you know, oh brave warriors, go up ahead. Oh mujahideen, go up ahead. Right? What kind of words would he use? You're brave. Like what would we think? Right? In Pashto we say, the nirbachiya. Right? You're the son of a manly person. Go move ahead. Right? What did the Prophet ﷺ say? He said, Ya ashab surat al-Baqarah. Allahu Akbar O people of Surah Al-Baqarah This shows Surah Al-Baqarah was like the pride and the honor of the Muslim Ummah When the companions, you know, when they heard this obviously They became motivated, they stopped hesitating, they jumped forward They said, we're the people of Surah Al-Baqarah Allah blessed us with this great Surah We're the Ummah that Allah has given us this amazing Surah Al-Baqarah so this was like the motivation and the pride that the Prophet ﷺ, he would actually encourage the Sahaba with these words. Many years later, there would be the battle of Yamama. This was a battle in which there was a man named Musaylama tul Kathab. Musaylama, he came forward and na'udhu billah, na'udhu billah, he made this claim that I'm the Prophet after Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm the next Prophet. So obviously, you know, he had his army and eventually they clashed together with the Muslim army. And it's mentioned in that battle as well, you had the Muhajirun and the Ansar, two, the two groups from the Muslims. And as the battle is continuing, there were also moments of danger, difficulty, bloodshed, 
lots of difficult situations. So the muhajirun and the ansar to motivate each other, they would say, Ya ashaba surat al Baqarah. Oh, people of Surah Baqarah, move forward, don't stay back, don't stay behind, don't hesitate, rush forward. So, again, from all the surahs of the Quran Kareem, they motivated them by saying, What? You're the people of Surah Al Baqarah. And some of the fada'il, the virtues of this great surah, it is narrated from Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala an that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that indeed the shaitan, he flees from that home. He runs away from that home in which Surah Al-Baqarah is recited. Right? So what's happening today inside of people's houses? What's happening inside of the households today? Arguments. There's no harmony. There's no peace. Brothers are fighting brothers. Sisters are fighting sisters. Parents have no Relationship with the kids. Kids have no relationship with the parents. Right? Wallahi, it's so saddening to hear the complaints that people give. I wish my son would just spend time with me. I wish he would just say salam to me and sit and eat with me. But all day, what does he do? The moment he comes home from school, he locks himself in his room, he shuts the door. We don't see him until he's on his way out of the door for school the next morning. These are the halat and the circumstances. Allahu Akbar. Can we imagine? Wallahi, these are things that should make us cry. A mother and a father who has the most love for their child. They've given everything for this child. Who sees this child and interacts with this child more than the own parents? The teachers at school. The teachers at school, they see the child, talk to the child, influence the child more than the own two parents that love this kid more than the world and everything that's inside of it. Allahu Akbar. All of this chaos, friction, people fighting with each other, the lack of barakah, right? Some people, you know, they say, Salatul Fajr, I put my alarm, I just can't hear the alarm. I sleep right through it. But when the alarm goes off for work, I suddenly wake up. Why is this? What is this lack of barakah happening from? Right? We hear people complaining of, you know, jinnat. People are complaining of shayateen. All of these types of things. Why are all of these evil things coming inside of our homes? The lack of Qur'an. The lack of Surah Al-Baqarah. The absence of all of these repellents that the Prophet ﷺ taught us. Right? So what happens? You have a cockroach infestation. But you say it's okay, there's no problem, just continue. There's bed bugs, we say it's okay, we continue. These problems don't fix on their own. You have to do what? Call the people, pest control, do something, protect your house, spray the place down, take your precautions to get rid of all of these things. Similarly, these frictions that we see, this chaos, this friction, this animosity, the hatred between family members. A lot of times we think it's, oh, it's, it's just normal. It just happens. There are underlying reasons. The repellent, the spray, the thing that's going to get rid of all of this is exactly what we're talking about tonight. Bringing in nur, right? They say, if there is darkness, right? There's darkness. The moment you switch on the light, what happens? All the darkness has ran away. All the darkness disappears. So, the world, the dunya, the shaitan, all of these things will bring darkness. If we're not turning on the light of the Qur'an, the light of Surah Al-Baqarah, the light of the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, then what's going to happen? We will remain in darkness. May Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala protect us all and grant us the love of the Qur'an Kareem. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, البقرة سنام القرآن وذروته ذا سورة البقرة This is the hump of the Quran and it's the peak of the Quran so you know the camel some camels they have one hump some camels they have two humps right the little arch on its back the huge 
little hill on its back. This um, hump which is on the back of the camel, it's an elevated position. So in Arab customs, when they want to talk about the peak of something, the highest form of something, they would say, man, that's the hump of the camel for this. Right? Somebody, mashallah, makes delicious food. They will say, man, that guy's uh, biryani, that's the hump of the camel of biryani that you will find. Right? It's the peak, it's the pinnacle. Because the hump of the camel is like the highest point, right? Where you're going to sit on. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying that Surah Al-Baqarah, this is the pinnacle, this is the height, it's the high point of the Qur'an Kareem. نَزَلَ مَعَ كُلِّ آيَةٍ مِّنْهَا ثَمَانُونَ malaka. With every ayah of Surah Al-Baqarah, 80 angels came down to reveal and to descend with each ayah of Surah Al-Baqarah. Allahu Akbar. And one of the ayat from Surah Al-Baqarah, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum, yani ayat al-kursi, this was taken from where? From beneath the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we can see Surah Al-Baqarah has a lot of virtues. Another hadith regarding the virtues of Surah Al-Baqarah where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, read Surah Baqarah and Surah Ali Imran because they will come on the day of judgment like two clouds. Allahu Akbar. Either like two clouds or two flocks of birds. Both of these surahs will come they will intercede for the believer. They remember the believers who used to read them, who used to practice upon them. And it is also mentioned that one time the Prophet ﷺ, he sent a delegation, he sent a group of companions, radiallahu anhu. So now he had to make an amir. This was the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Anytime people would go for travel, he would select an amir over them. So when the Prophet ﷺ was selecting the Amir, he said, which surahs do you know? So some people said, I know these surahs. How about you? I know these surahs. How about you? I know these surahs. And from amongst this group, there was one of the youngest of these people, Ahdathuhum Sinna, a youngster from this group. He said, O oh Rasulullah, I know this surah and this surah, and I also know Surah Al-Baqarah. So when the Prophet ﷺ heard this, he emphasized and he said, Ama'aka Surah Al-Baqarah? Do you really have Surah Al-Baqarah? You've memorized it? The Surah is with you? Qala na'am. He said, yes, I know Surah Al-Baqarah. Qala idhab fa'anta amiruhum. The Prophet ﷺ said, go, delegation, go, this youngster, he's the Amir over you because he has Surah Al-Baqarah. Right, so we can see um, it's a very blessed surah. It's full of many different aspects in the life of, of the believer. Right, Surah Al-Baqarah, we know it's the longest surah of the Quran. So it contains many different injunctions. Firstly, remember in Surah Al-Fatiha, we talked about the straight path. Sirat al-Mustaqim. The very next surah, Surah Al-Baqarah, it tells you what is the straight path, Tawheed, Risala, and Akhirah. The three components for Islam and for Iman, right? Is number one, oneness of Allah, the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and belief in the Akhirah. So the principles of faith, many, many ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah, they cover the principles of Iman and the principles of faith. However, other points in the life of a believer, right? Other things that a Muslim needs to be guided and be successful. Many places of Surah Al-Baqarah cover these. And just as, you know, uh, on a very surface level, Surah Al-Baqarah, it mentions individual 
and social akhlaq. As a human being by myself, what akhlaq do I need to be successful? As a community and a society, what do we need to be successful? Surah Al-Baqarah covers those things. Ethics and morals, right? For spiritual progression, what does a person need? All of these are mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah. Certain aspects of worship, these are mentioned all in Surah Al-Baqarah. Surah Baqarah is so comprehensive. When Amirul Mu'mineen Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala an, he learned and memorized Surah Al-Baqarah in the time of the Prophet alayhi salam. How long did it take Umar radiyallahu an to memorize Surah Al-Baqarah? Keep in mind, they would not just memorize and then finish to the end. They would memorize 10 verses and then they would focus on it. They would practice on it. They would implement it in their life. They would teach it to other people. Then they would say, okay, these 10 verses is part of me now. Let me go to the next 10. Surah Baqarah, of course it's long, but it's also so comprehensive. How long did it take Umar radiallahu an to memorize Surah Al-Baqarah? 10 years? Close? Anyone else? 12 years it took Umar radiallahu an to memorize Surah Al-Baqarah. Not because his uh, hifz was weak. Not because his memorization was weak. Na'udhu billah. These were people who had the peak of memorization. But what was the reason? Surah Al-Baqarah is so comprehensive. His son, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu an. How long did it take him? Eight years it took his son, Abdullah ibn Umar, to memorize Surah Al-Baqarah. Another interesting thing, brothers and sisters, about Surah Al-Baqarah, this was the first surah that was revealed when the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina. So, in the life of Medina Munawwara, when the Prophet ﷺ took Medina as his new home, the first surah to be revealed was Baqarah. And the last verse of the Qur'an is where? Surah Al-Baqarah. Amazing. So the first surah of Medina was Baqarah. Parts of it. Verses of it. And then the last verse of Medina and the last verses of the entire Qur'an, of the entire life of the Prophet ﷺ were also where? In Surah Al-Baqarah. So, subhanallah, it's a surah full of wisdom, full of ahkam, full of many different aspects. Ibn al-Arabi rahimahullah, he, he mentions, the ulama used to say, that Surah al-Baqarah, it has 1,000 commands. 1,000 prohibitions. 1,000 words of hikmah and wisdom. And 1,000 references to the incidents of people of the past. So look at how packed Surah Al-Baqarah. It's full of, alhamdulillah, many different aspects for us to learn. We start off with the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alif la Mim. This is called al huruful Muqatta'at. And it's from the secrets and the mysteries of the Qur'an Kareem. Nobody knows the true meanings of the huruf muqatta'at. What are the huruf muqatta'at? Those surahs that begin with letters. Alif, Lam, Mim. Alif, Lam, Mim, Ra. Ha, Mim. Kaf, Ha, Ya, Ayn, Saad. Surah Maryam. Ha, Mim, Ayn, Sin, Qaf. So different surahs, there's also Qaf, Wal Qur'an Al Majid. The surah begins with individual letters from the alphabet. And Allahu Akbar, if you think about this, in any other language, a sequence of letters can never be as beautiful as the surahs from the Qur'an Kareem. Right? Can you imagine Shakespeare? Or, or some famous poet 
They put their poetry together and then they say A, B, C. What will everybody say? You'll laugh at them. It'll be hysterical. It'll be a comedy. But Allahu Akbar, the Quran is so eloquent. Even the disbelievers, when they're listening to Alif Lam Mim, Kaf Ha Ya Ain Sad, and imagine when the Prophet ﷺ is reading it. They're bewildered, they're perplexed, they're amazed. What is this Quran? What do these letters represent? These are from the secrets and the mysteries of the Quran Kareem. What is our duty as Muslims? We accept and we believe in the Hurufi Muqatta'at. We leave the meanings to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe inshallah one day, if we have the shawq and we have the desire, then in the akhirah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may expose it to us and inform us. What did these Hurufi Muqatta'at actually mean? Right? And subhanallah, they mention that for people of knowledge, people that are engaged in learning and teaching, the greatest gift, the greatest bounty of Jannah for them, of course, after seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what will be their happiness in Jannah? Getting the answers to all of these questions. They'll go to the Prophet alayhi salam. They'll ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, what was alif lam mim? What did it mean? What was the alif for? What was the lam for? What was the mim for? Right? Because they had this shawq in this dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will quench their thirst in the akhirah. ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ That is the book wherein there is no doubt inside of it. That is the book. Now here's an interesting point, brothers and sisters. When we're reading Qur'an, where is the Qur'an? It's in front of us. Right? So if we're looking grammatically, it seems like it should have made more sense to say what? This is the book that there's no doubt inside of it. Because where is it? It's right in front of you. Right? If something is in front of you, you say this. You don't say that. If it's far away from you, then you'll say that. So why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say that is the book? There are two reasons why. Number one, because it's in reference back to Surah Al-Fatiha. O oh, insan, you asked for guidance. You said, اِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ mustaqim." That اِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ mustaqim," that guidance that you were asking for, it's this book which has no doubt inside of it. So that is referring to that dua you made in Surah Al-Fatiha. Second reason why it's that is the book instead of this is the book. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving an indication, a subtle secret hint that yes, the Qur'an may be in front of you, but don't forget the status of this Qur'an. It is so high. It is so amazing. It demands so much of respect that although it's in front of you, its status is way, way above you. So even though it's here, it's like you're saying, that is the book. The book is way up there. It's way above us. It's way, way more respected and magnified and appreciated than we could imagine. Hudan lil muttaqeen. This book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is a guidance for who? For the people who have taqwa. For the people who fear Allah. Of course, the Qur'an, it's a guidance for everybody. But Allah is indicating the true recipients of guidance, the true people who will benefit from the Qur'an are, are who? Those who are going to follow it. If you don't follow it, how is the Qur'an going to benefit you? And then in the next verse, Allah Azza wa Jal, He explains, Who are these muttaqeen? Who are these God-fearing people that the Qur'an is a guidance for them? Number one, they are those who believe in the unseen. They have iman in that which they have not seen with their eyes. Number two, they establish salah. 
And number three, وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ From that which we have given them, they spend. So three sifat, three descriptions of the muttaqoon, the God-fearing people who will benefit from the Qur'an. Allah mentioned three descriptions. Number one, they believe in the unseen. And number two, they establish the salah. And number three, they give in charity. These are the three Descriptions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given for them in this verse. So number one, they believe in the unseen. Brothers and sisters, if we look historically, the nations of the past, they would always ask for proof. They would always ask for more than what the prophets would give them. Musa alayhi salam comes with his staff. He comes with his shining hand. Salih alayhi salam, he comes with the camel out of the mountain. All of these miracles were given. But they would do what? They would always ask for more. To such an extent, what did the Bani Israel say? They said, Arina Allah jahratan. Allahu Akbar. After Musa alayhi salam's staff, after the shining hand, after they heard Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on top of Mount Tur. They still were not content. And what did they say? They said, Arina Allah jahratan. Let us see Allah openly. Let us see Allah with our eyes. Then we will believe. Brothers and sisters, belief in Islam, it means we believe in the words of Allah and His Rasul more than what we believe in the things that we see with our eyes. You know, when you see something, you have conviction, right? If I look at my phone, I say, look, it's white. I can see with my eyes that it's white. We believe in it now because we have the conviction. We've witnessed it with our eyes. True iman, it means if, the, if Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said something, we believe in it more than we would believe in the things that we've witnessed and seen with our own two eyes. My eyes could have a problem. My eyes could be discolored, right? My understanding could be warped. But Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there could be no misunderstanding from them, right? So my faith and conviction in my eyes, in my ears, in my heart, in my understanding, these could be flawed. These could have mistakes. But the Qur'an and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, these are free from mistakes. And subhanallah, this concept, we have covered it. For example, it's mentioned uh, in the story of Fir'aun. That as he's passing away, he's drowning and he's breathing his last and he sees the miracle in front of him and he sees the angel of death and he sees Jibreel alayhi salam is coming down. Then quickly, what does he say? لا إله إلا الذي آمنت به بنو إسرائيل وأنا من المسلمين. He says, "There's no god except the god of the, you know, the god of Musa and the god of Harun, the god of the Bani Israel. I believe in him. Of course, you believe in him now. You're drowning. You're about to die. You can't breathe. You're seeing Jibril. Of course, you believe now. And what happened at that moment? Jibril عليه السلام he stuffed his mouth with the dirt from the floor. He said, you will not be able to proclaim the shahada now. You will not be able to believe now. Al-an. Is it now that you're going to believe? Waqad asait. Whereas your whole life you disbelieved. Right? And now that he's seeing and he's witnessing, now you're going to believe? Respected listeners, we have to understand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives us signs. He doesn't give us his full description. He doesn't come down to the earth and say, Oh, insan, believe in me. Because if he does that, then where is the test? There's no more test if he does that. The test is without having seen him physically, just relying on the few, uh, the many signs that he gives us, we believe in him through those signs. That's what it means to have iman. That's what it means to have faith. Not through your eyes. It's mentioned one time, 
a person came to the Prophet ﷺ and he complained of istitlaqul batan. The person had diarrhea. He couldn't control his stomach. So the Prophet ﷺ said, give him honey. Feed him honey. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him what? The shifa for this man is going to be by eating honey. So feed him honey. The person came back to the Prophet ﷺ and what did he say? He said, Ya Rasulullah, my brother has eaten the honey, it has only increased his diarrhea. He got more sick. So what did the Prophet ﷺ say? Did he say, stop the honey? Oh no, there must be a mistake in this. Of course, we're not doctors, we're not medical experts. The hadith doesn't mean every sick person, for every sickness, you give them honey and it's going to be good for them. That's not what the hadith means. The Prophet ﷺ knew because the order was coming from where? The, the order was coming from Allah. So the second time when he came back, the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh, the diarrhea increased? Okay, give him honey. Give him honey again. Again the person came back. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I gave him honey a second time. His diarrhea is getting worse. Third time, fourth time, he kept coming. The Prophet ﷺ continuously said what? Give him honey. And finally, what did the Prophet ﷺ say? He said, Sadaqallahu wa kathaba batnu akhik. Allah has spoken the truth. The stomach of your brother has told a lie. Allah has told the truth. The stomach of your brother has told a lie. And subhanallah, after some time, what happened? The honey became a shifa for him through Allah's mercy and he was cured. Right? But the point is, what do we learn from this? His iman right, was where? In the ghayb. Not based off of physical things that we could see with our eyes. You know, imagine if the teacher, he gives you all the answers for the test. The teacher gives you all the answers. And then you take the test. Is it really an exam anymore? It's no longer an exam because you've been given... All of the answers, right? So like this, Allah does not give us the answers in this world. He doesn't show Himself manifest to us, right? The Qur'an doesn't, you know, start walking and saying, I'm the truth, everybody, believe in me. The Prophet ﷺ doesn't appear and, and, you know, speak directly to people. This is not how the deen works. Allah gives us hints. Allah gives us indications. It's up to the believer to do what? to follow, to practice, and to implement. And I'm going to mention one important story from the life of Harun Rashid, rahimahullah, who was a very great amir and a great leader of this ummah. So it's mentioned that in his time, his wife was also a very respected woman, a very pious woman. Her name was Zubaydah, rahimahullah. And... Some of us probably know um, she is famous for making the famous canal in the Middle East, which mashallah, it goes through several countries. She made this canal uh, from her own wealth so that water could be distributed to the people who are thirsty and conveniently the water can you know, go through all of these different territories. So she was a very, very respected and pious woman, Zubaydah, rahimahullah ta'ala, rahimahullah. And her husband was the Khalifa Harun Rashid, rahimahullah. So, one time, Harun Rashid was passing by on the street, and there was a poor man who was selling a shack. We know what a shack is? Small little house made of maybe, you know, aluminum and these kinds of little scraps. They put a little small four walls together, make a little shack. And he's selling this. He's a poor man. He's trying to make some income. So, as Harun Rashid is passing by, the poor man probably didn't know he's the Amir. He said, one dirham, nice shack over here. You want to buy my shack? It's going to be one dirham. Harun Rashid looks at this man and he says, this shack? Habibi, if you give me the shack for free, I won't take it also. Even for free, I won't take this shack. Why, why would I pay you a dirham to get this rundown shack? So, eventually, what happened? His wife Zubaydah 
She heard about this. And she sees that this poor man, he's selling this shack for one dirham. She says, support the man. He's not begging. He's trying his best to earn a lawful income. Support him. And what does she do? She gives for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, you know, they continue on on their journey. So that same night, it's mentioned that um, Harun Rashid, he sees in his dream that his wife Zubaydah, she's flying all around Jannah. And she's got this amazing palace inside of Jannah. He says, where did you get this palace from? I'm the Amir, right? I'm the Amirul Mu'mineen, I'm the Khalifa. And your palace is this big in Jannah. What did you do to get this? She said, Ya Harun Rashid, don't you know? This palace, I bought it for one dirham. Don't you remember that poor beggar on the street who was selling his shack for one dirham? This huge palace in Jannah, I bought it for one dirham because I gave it to the poor beggar on the street who was selling the shack. So the next day, what happens? Harun Rashid rushes to that man. And that man, he didn't know this. But that man, his name was Bahlul, rahimahullah. He was a great friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was a wali of Allah. So the, the awliya, the friends of Allah, Allah sometimes reveals things to them, gives them certain messages. You know, so he knew somehow the dream that Harun Rashid saw. So he came and he was giving this dirham. He said, I want to buy a shack too. I want to buy it. Here's the dirham. So Bahlul said, one dirham? He said, today I've raised my price, O Harun. I've raised the price. How much is my shack today? Everything in this world and everything that, that's contained within, within this world, that's the price for the shack today. Harun Rashid said, you know, I'm the Amir, but that's too much for me. How am I going to afford that? He said, no, you don't understand. He said, when you didn't know about the rewards, you didn't see that dream of your wife and the palace that she had, that's when you're going to get the true rewards. That's when you're truly going to benefit when you give and you don't 100% know what's going to happen. But now that you've seen the Jannah that Zubaydah got, you've seen the palace that she was walking in, you're not going to be able to get away with one dirham now. Now it's not going to work that way. Allahu Akbar. So like this, brothers and sisters, we see Iman means believing in the unseen. Wait for the Akhirah. Right? When we give, when we pray, when we fast, whatever it is that we do. Sometimes what do we expect? What do we expect as Muslims? Man, I'm going to fast Thursday. This application that I'm giving for this job, Friday, I'm going to get it for sure. Allah is going to show me. Right? And then you fasted Thursday, you put in the application, sorry, we hired somebody else. You say, man, why did I fast? My fasting didn't benefit me. My fasting was useless. I'm not going to fast next week. Na'udhu billah. The rewards are there. You just may not see it in this dunya. You may see it in the next world. And Allahu Akbar, the Sahaba and the people of the past, do you know what they would say? When dunya would come to them, Good food, good drinks, wealth, gold, silver. When these things would come to them, they would get scared. They would fear. And they would say, Ya Allah, we're afraid that maybe you've given us the rewards for our good deeds in this dunya. And then in the akhirah, there will be nothing for us. We're scared, Ya Allah. We don't want our rewards here. We want our rewards there. Because that's where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give the best. Right? Remember we covered in Surah Al-Fatiha, he is Rahman in the dunya for everybody. But his Rahim for the Muslims of, that will be in Jannah, in the Akhirah, the sifat of Rahim will be much better than the good things that we get in this dunya. Allahu Akbar. The last thing which I will mention is Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an. When the Prophet alayhi salam, he went for the Isra and Mi'raj. The Kuffar of Makkah and the Quraysh, they were laughing at the Prophet ﷺ. They were laughing at the Muslims. And they said, look at this ridiculous claim. He went from Makkah all the way to Jerusalem. Does anyone in their right state of mind believe this? Some of the companions, radiallahu anhum, they said, wait, 
Let us talk to the Prophet ﷺ. Let us hear from him. Let us hear what he has to say. Did he go on this journey? Was it a reality? Let us speak to him and confirm. They also came to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. When they came to Abu Bakr, they said, ha ha ha, your Prophet said he's gone thousands of miles from Mecca to Jerusalem in one night. Do you actually believe this? Do you actually believe this? You know, like how uh, non, some disbelievers today, they will make fun of Muslims. And they will say things about the deen. And they will say, ha ha ha, does your religion actually teach this? Does your religion actually teach that? Did the Prophet ﷺ actually do this? Did the Prophet ﷺ actually do that? This laughter and this, you know, comedy that these people want to make against Muslims. It's not something new. They did this back in the day as well. When they told this to Abu Bakr Siddiq, do you know what he said? He didn't say, let me talk to the Prophet ﷺ. He didn't say, let me do some investigation and research. The first thing that he said, if the Prophet ﷺ said it, it's true and I believe it, O oh, Quraysh. Laugh all you want. If my Prophet said it, 100% it's true. This is what you call Iman Bil Ghaib. And from that moment, he was given this title, Siddiq. Abu Bakr as Siddiq. Because he testified of the Siddiq, the truthfulness of the Prophet. This is Iman Bil Ghaib, brothers and sisters. You know, today we have the sickness. Today we have the sickness that a person will hear an ayat of the Qur'an. They'll hear a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Conviction will not be there. Let me hear the science behind this. Let me hear the research behind this. Oh, now I believe in it. Okay, now it makes sense to me. Okay, now my heart is content. Right? There are certain things in, in the deen, certain questions that people get, doubts that we get. When a non-Muslim researcher, when a non-Muslim scientist they say, oh yeah, you know, the embryonic development of the Qur'an, it's on point, it's very accurate. Then Muslims start going crazy. Look, the scientists backed it up. Wow, we have to believe in this. Look, even the scientists said it's accurate. Who is the scientist? Allah said it's right. Allah, the Lord of the heavens and the earth, He revealed this book, He said it's right. Why do you need the scientists to confirm it to be correct for you? Right? So many Muslims, right? They say, oh, Michael Hart, non-Muslim, he's written a book, the number one most influential man in the history of the world was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then we get confidence in this. In reality, this shouldn't be our motivation. Allah already praised the Prophet alayhi salam. That should be enough for us, right? But this is one of the sicknesses because we lack iman bil ghaib. We lack Iman, belief in the unseen. We want to know the dalil for everything. Why is this like this? Why is that like that? Give me some proof so I can believe in it. This is the way the Bani Israel used to be. We want to believe in Allah. Show us, where is He? Let us see His face. Let Him come down and talk to us. Right? So we're like this sometimes. Yeah, uh, hadith, yeah, I like it. But why is it like this? Yes, one is academics to be able to explain it. No problem. But for our belief sake, Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when they said it, that is enough for our beliefs, inshaAllah. Moving on to the next few ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ They are those people who believe in that which is revealed to you, وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ They believe in that which was revealed before you. So all of the previous scriptures, we believe the original scriptures that was revealed to Isa alayhi salam, that was revealed to Musa alayhi salam. We believe in those, not in the alterations and the errors that human beings wrote inside. So we believe in the previous scriptures, not the ones that people have in their hands today. The previous ones were the authentic ones which Allah revealed. We believed in those. هُمْ يُوقِنُونَ And in the akhirah, they have conviction. Not just belief, but conviction. Every step, every word, everything that we do, we're thinking, what's going to be the consequence in the akhirah? If I cheat, what's the consequence in the akhirah? If I lie, what's the consequence in the akhirah? Akhirah is always in front of our eyes. This is from the sifat 
of the mu'mineen. Ula'ika ala hudam min rabbihim. These are the people who are upon guidance from their Lord. Wa ula'ika humul muflihun. These are the people who will be successful. And in the next few, uh, the next part of the ruku, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then mentions the other categories of people. First, we did the mu'mineen, the believers. Then Allah is going to mention the qualities of who? Disbelievers. And then the qualities of the munafiqeen, the hypocrites. And Allahu Akbar, if we look at this, it's so exactly in line with what we see in the world today. Inshallah, next Tuesday, I encourage everyone, please attend, listen carefully. We will see exactly bi'aynihi what we see in the world today. These sifat, exactly the way Allah mentions it, word for word. These sifat are alive today. We're witnessing it right now on a global scale. May Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala make us true believers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us strong. May Allah azza wa jal give us these beautiful sifat of the true believers that are mentioned. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakumullahu khairan.